I want to welcome you all to the 19th Century Charitable Association in Oak Park, where it is our vision to be a dynamic cultural center for community learning. Good afternoon. I am Judy Eckberg, Chair of the Social Science Committee. Our program committees have scheduled 30 programs in this season of our enrichment series as part of our mission to strengthen our community through learning, giving, and sharing our landmark building. Following this program, there will be a short period of questions and answers, and then you are invited downstairs for tea and conversation. Today's program is being presented by Leslie Goddard. She is an award-winning actress and scholar who has been presenting history programs for more than 20 years. She holds a PhD from Northwestern University, specializing in American studies and US history, as well as a master's degree in theater. A former museum director, she is the author of three books on history and currently works full time as an author and public speaker. Before the Food Network, most Americans only knew one famous television chef, Julia Child. Every week, thousands tuned in to watch her demonstrate the art of French cooking on the French staff, her PBS television show. Leslie Goddard brings Julia Child to life in this portrayal where a child discusses everything from her relationship with her husband, Paul Child, to the mishaps of cooking on live television. Bon appetit. <clears throat> I'm Julia Child. Today on The French Chef, we are making a Queen of Sheba cake. Now this cake is very chocolatey with a rich buttery taste, but the texture is quite light and delicate. Like many French cakes, it is very moist, and for that, we want it slightly underdone. Now we don't use whole eggs for this. We are going to separate them, or as my friend Simka likes to say, we want broken eggs. We start by putting the egg yolks in a bowl and we're going to beat in sugar and melted chocolate to that. And then you see, you don't use baking powder. You use egg whites to make the cake light. Egg whites are very important in many French souffles and desserts. You start with a large round bottomed copper bowl. This is one of those times it is good to have a large round bottom. <laughs> And when you beat the egg whites, you want them to rise up about seven times the original volume. You use a great big handheld whisk and you beat, beat, beat until they are absolutely smooth, very smooth and perfectly velvety. This is why a copper bowl works so well. The egg whites sort of cling to the copper, which lets them rise up more and... Oh dear. This does feel awfully bad on the knees. This might be enough rehearsing for today. Now, when I was younger, I could work all day, write a book, film a television episode, then host a dinner party at night. But as we get older, we slow down, don't we? My knees hurt. People have been telling me for years to stand up straight. 
many years of bending over, ovens and counters not built to my height. I think I might be becoming permanently slouched. <laughs> I was telling my husband Paul the other day, it might be time for the French chef to end. We've been doing this for 10 years now. But Paul, I said, what if I quit and just wither away? What if I become one of those boring retired people? <laughs> I don't know if I could stand that. I think my great misfortune is that I found my passion late in life. I was in my 30s when I started cooking. I was in my 50s when I became famous, and that happened by accident. This was right after our cookbook, Mastering the Art of Ch French Cooking, came out. A Boston public television station asked me to appear on one of their shows about the cookbook and talk about it. Well, yes, I said, I'd like that. But I don't think that I can talk for 30 minutes straight. I'm going to need a hot plate. Well, I thought I would demonstrate how to make an omelet, a lovely French omelet. They told me that no one had ever needed a hot plate on their show before. Oh, I can quite believe that. I am still going to need one. So I showed up that day with a frying pan and a package of eggs and a spatula. No one had any idea what I was up to, but I set up a nice little station for making an omelet. Well, the cameramen, they were used to people sitting in chairs talking about books. Here I was, all six feet, two inches of me, towering over the table. It never occurred to me that this might be difficult for them. So I just chatted away, cracking the eggs, heating up the pan. In go the eggs, and you should hear a nice sizzle when they hit the pan. They were frantic. Should they aim the camera at my hands or at my face? What would they do if I dropped an egg? They needn't have worried. An omelet is a very simple but marvelous dish. It really shows you how French cooking is just a wonderful way to treat food. All it is, really, is just good cooking. Do you remember American eating back then in 1961? Processed, packaged foods everywhere. TV dinners were all the rage. And jello salads with bits of marshmallows in them. You remember? Well, the next day, they received about a dozen telephone calls, which was a lot for them, from people who wanted more of that tall lady cooking. The television executives had never even thought about doing a cooking show, but they called me up, asked if I'd be interested. I would love it, I said, and I wouldn't charge much. How about... $50 an episode, because it would help sell the book. We could even call the show Mastering the Art of French Cooking. Oh, no, no, they said. It has to fit on one line in the TV guide. <laughs> we like the French chef. Oh, I don't know, I said. I'm not a chef, and, and I'm not French. No matter, it fits. And I did hope we could bring some real French chefs onto the show. 
course, that never happened, but the name stuck. So we did three episodes to start. We made a French omelette, we made a hearty bouffe bourguignon, and we made French onion soup with lots of onions and broth and cheese and wine. I am a great believer in cooking with good wine. Occasionally, I even put it in the food. <laughs> Now, those three episodes went well, so they ordered 13 more. Now, here is the great irony in all of this. When I was growing up, I couldn't boil water. I liked to eat, but cooking, there seemed no point to it. My mother could only cook two things, Welsh rabbit, and baking powder biscuits. She rarely went in the kitchen because we always had a cook, and we ate a lot of good, sensible New England food, <laughs> which is really odd because I grew up about as far from New England as you can get in Pasadena, which is where I was born back in 1912. What a lovely place to grow up. There was lots of room then to ride bicycles and play pranks. And the McWilliams children, we needed room. You might think I'm tall. My brother John is six feet four. My sister Dort, six feet five inches tall. My mother loved to tell people, I have 18 feet of children. <laughs> now, I went to Smith College simply because that's where my mother went, graduated in 1934 with a C average, and vague dreams of writing a great American novel. I really had no plans. I went back to California, spent about five years just playing golf and going to cocktail parties. But I was pining for real adventure. And that came with World War II. They needed volunteers, so I signed up. I joined the OSS. That's the spy agency, because my first thought was I would be a good spy. <laughs> but apparently, when you're six feet two inches tall and a woman, it's rather hard to blend in inconspicuously. But they did take me on as a typist. And in 1943, they sent me to Ceylon, today's Sri Lanka. What a fascinating place. And that, that is where I met Paul. Paul Child. Now he's 10 years older than me, very important. He's an artist, so they put him in charge of the maps and diagrams for that region. Not at all attractive in those days. A bald head on such a young man. <laughs> but we shared a great love of adventure. Soon, the two of us were going out. I remember exploring ancient temples with him, watching caravans of elephants go by. And Paul loved good food. He opened me up to all sorts of new, exciting dishes. When Paul was transferred to China, I got myself transferred there too. I was thrilled. Because Paul and I both hated army food, all of those boiled potatoes and canned tomatoes. So together, we would sneak out we would eat at the local restaurants, real Chinese food, a revelation. 
Of course, eventually the war ended and we went our separate ways, but the letters were soon flying back and forth between the two of us. Dear Paul, I must tell you about this perfectly wonderful book I just read. Dear Paul, I do love getting your letters. I've been haunting the mailbox. Dear Paul, what is it you have done to me? I feel the most delightful, immeasurable warmth and delight when I read your letters. After that, well, it heats up a bit. <laughs> it's a good thing the postman never read these. <laughs> we just realized we had to be together. That was all there was to that. So here we are on our wedding day. There's a bandage on my forehead. The day before our wedding, we were driving down a road when a truck spun out of control and hit our car. We were fine, but they rushed us to the hospital. Cancel the wedding? Why? Who cares? So on our wedding day, I had a giant bandage covering the stitches on my head, and Paul had to hobble around on a cane. We didn't mind it a bit. Goodbye, Julia McWilliams. Hello, Julia Child. Now, we moved to Washington because Paul was working for the State Department, and I just said, I am going to be a housewife. I just dove in with great enthusiasm and no idea what I was doing. <laughs> Paul came home one night and I said, oh, Paul, I did want to make a nice dinner for you, but this is the greatest comedy there is. I was going to make a chowder with this lovely piece of cod. The, the recipe said, cook it and stir it. So I cooked it and stirred it and cooked it and stirred it and cooked it and stirred it until it just disintegrated. It just dissolved into mush. I'm hopeless. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I had to take a whole series of classes just to master the basics. Paul was very patient. And then one day, he came home to say the government wanted him to head up a new exhibitions program in France. Would I want to move to Paris for a few years? Want to? I'd love it. Now that would be the greatest adventure there is. And that is how we found ourselves in France in 1948. As soon as our big powder blue Buick was unloaded from the ship, we squeezed our luggage in, and then somehow we managed to squeeze ourselves in, and we set off to drive to Paris. We arrived at lunchtime in the city of Rouen. Paul's prized Michelin guidebook recommended a restaurant called La Corone. Oh dear, I thought. I hope I'm dressed appropriately. You know, a French restaurant. Well, I needn't have worried. The maitre d' greeted Paul so warmly. For a minute, I thought maybe they were dear old friends. There was no pretentiousness. Not a single rolled eyeball or look down the nose as I had expected. On the contrary, they seemed delighted that we were there. They seated us in a big room with wooden beams and a fire in the fireplace. Two businessmen sitting near us. Paul, Paul, what are they talking about? He told me 
that the waiter was explaining to them all about the chicken, how it's prepared, what wine he recommends with it. Wine? With lunch? <laughs> In those days, I drank very little wine, and never in the middle of the day. Ah, Paul said, but in France, food is a fine art. Wine always accompanies dinner and often lunch as well. Well then, we shall simply have to do the same. I didn't speak a word of French yet, so Paul ordered for both of us. First, oysters, smooth, briny, nothing like the oysters I was used to at home. And then the main course, a sole munier. It's a very simple dish. It's a large flat fish cooked in a pan with lots of brown butter and just a sprinkling of lemon juice and parsley. The waiter placed the dish in front of us, stepped back, and he said, Bon appétit. Do you know this phrase, bon appétit? It means, I hope you have a hearty appetite and enjoy the meal. Well, I closed my eyes and I breathed in that fragrance. Then I lifted a forkful to my mouth. This fish was light and delicate with the perfect balance of butter and the ocean. It was the most perfect bite of food I had ever eaten. This entire meal, the, the salad, the cheese, the bread, the coffee, there is no word for it but perfection. I floated out of that restaurant in a haze, only pausing long enough to tell the waiter, merci, monsieur. I spent days ordering Sol Meunier everywhere I went. Then I started trying all sorts of new, exciting dishes. Oh, I loved everything about Paris. To learn the language, I spent days only permitting myself to speak in French. So riding the bus, taking the car in for repairs wandering the street markets, talking to the vendors. <clears throat> Bun jewer. <laughs> they just stared at me. I could never get those dummies to understand their own language. <laughs> but all great fun and such warm, friendly people. And the restaurants in Paris, the ritual they made of placing the tablecloth and the wine glass and every detail of preparing the food. For example, to make an étouffante, they would take a loaf of bread, hollow it out, rub it with the freshest, creamiest local butter, bake it to a golden brown, and fill it with crevettes in cream and butter. Mm. Thank goodness there were no nutrition police in those days. It was good old-fashioned French cooking. Lots of cream, lots of butter. None of that other spread. They would judge bread by how many crumbs were left on the table. The more, the better. But Paul, I don't think I could just eat all day, every day. You're going to see me balloon up if I do that. I really have to do something. So I took a class on hat making. Uh, then I learned how to play cards. Uh, and 
finally, someone said to me, well, if you like French food, why not learn how to cook it? Why not? Now, if you wanted to learn French cooking in Paris in 1949, there was only one place to go. Le Cordon Bleu. So I marched down and signed up. I dove in head first, determined to learn everything. They put me in a class with two housewives. On the very first day, the teacher said to us, today we are going to learn how to boil an egg. Now, this wouldn't do. I knew at this point how to boil an egg. So I went to see the school's director, Madame Brassart. Madame Brassart, I must be put in a more advanced class. No, no, she said. You are where you belong. Madame Brassart, I insist. I must be put in a more advanced class. You are an American woman. The American women, they do not know how to cook at all. I refuse. Only with the greatest reluctance did she move me to a new class. All men, mostly GIs who had been army cooks and now wanted to learn just enough to open their own restaurants. Well, I just refused to be nervous. I'm quite used to standing out in a crowd. So I tied on my apron and took my position. Our teacher was Chef Max Bunyard, a wonderful man and a real classicist. He had been cooking in French restaurants for 60 years. I couldn't have asked for a better instructor. We started every day at 7.30, chopping up vegetables, mixing sauces. We would cook for several hours. Then I would run home, whip up a fancy lunch for Paul, and then run back to watch the afternoon demonstrations. I loved everything, all that care they took. Do you know? There are a hundred different ways to cook a potato. I wanted to know them all. And every variation on a sauce gives it a new name. If you add grated cheese to a sauce bechamel, it makes it a Mornay. One day, we made ham mousse. So these nine men and I, we had to pound that ham by hand and then rub it through a great big drum sieve and scrape it off the bottom with tortoise shell scoops. Absolutely divine. Of course, it took us two hours to do. <laughs> That would be two minutes today in a modern food processor. We didn't have those then. But oh, the pots and pans and gadgets. I bought everything. I bought copper bowls and rolling pins, whisks. The French have eight different kinds. I bought them all. I bought tart rings, lemon zesters, long needles for lauding roasts. This became an obsession I have never been able to break. <laughs> Paul couldn't pry me out of the kitchen, not even with an oyster knife. I was clacking the dishes, whistling away like a magpie. Of course, I think my American friends thought I was out of my mind to shop, cook, and serve your own food. <laughs> Women in our circles had cooks back then. Pillsbury and General Mills had just introduced cake 
mixes. Thank goodness I didn't know that. Well, one day I decided I knew everything. So I invited my friend Winnie over for lunch. I served her the most vile eggs Florentine imaginable. Measure the ingredients? I don't need to bother with that anymore. I just improvised a sauce Monet beating in Gruyere cheese until it all congealed in a big mass. And I couldn't find spinach, so I decided to use chicory instead. <laughs> it turns out chicory is much too tough. It simply refused to wilt in time. It was awful. It was worse than a disaster. But I wasn't going to say anything because that would force her to tell me it was all fine. I knew perfectly well it wasn't. So I didn't say a word. I served it all up and we painfully ate every bite of it. No apologies. Never apologize for your cooking. I don't understand these women who are always apologizing for their food. If the food is vile, you must simply grin and bear it. <laughs> now, after a short while, some friends introduced me to two French women who also love to cook. Simone Beck, everyone calls her Simka, and Louisette Berthel. Before you knew it, we had opened our own cooking school. Only four pupils. We rather grandly called ourselves L'Ecole de Trois Gourmandes, the school of the three hearty eaters. It was really the greatest fun I had ever had. From the very first class, I knew I loved teaching. And then, Simga and Louisette said they were working on a cookbook, French recipes for American cooks. Would I want to help make sure it worked for an American audience? If I had known that this would consume the next 10 years of my life, I don't know if I would have agreed. Well, Louisette never took the book seriously. She has a family, but, but Simka? Simka is une force de la nature. She is not merely une Française. She is une super Française. We shared a drive for perfection. Every recipe we tested over and over. We questioned everything. Simka, should we use butter or oil in this recipe? The answer was always the same. Butter, that is the French way. Simka, should we cut down on the milk in your sauce a la Isle? No, that is not the French way. Simka wanted everything done the French way. She's not an easy woman to work with, very opinionated. But then again, so am I. No, Simka, broken eggs mean something different than what you think it does. We both wanted real historic recipes using authentic techniques, but they had to work for an American audience. For example, Simka's baking is inspired absolutely divine, but we could not make her pie crust. Every time we tried, they crumbled like gypsum. Why? This recipe had been in her family for generations. I thought maybe it was my oven, but I got a regulator and it didn't fix the problem. What was the problem? None of us at first suspected the flour. 
gold medal flower imported from the US. French flower, we discovered, is much fatter, full of body. American flower had been reworked to extend its shelf life. They processed out the fat, which meant a third more fat had to be put in to get a good short crust. Every pastry recipe had to be rejiggered, rewritten, retested. And so many French foods were unknown in the US. You couldn't buy creme fraiche in an American grocery store. A shallot? Gruyere cheese? Unknown. Now, after three years in Paris, Paul was transferred. We had to move. First, we went to Marseille. Then we went to Germany, back to Washington, then to Norway. All the while, letters were flying back and forth between me and Simka. Simka, dear, I am testing out our cassoulet. Must it absolutely include preserved goose? And Simka would write back, absolument. <laughs> Simka, dearie, I am moving on to canard à l'orange. How does one teach a housewife how to choose a duck, wash it, disjoint it, truss it, tell when it's cooked, and choose a vegetable to go with it? Do tell me again, dearie, why did we ever take this project on? And then again, how could we do anything else? Lots and lots of letters. When I wasn't shopping or experimenting on a stove, I was typing up four or five copies of every recipe to send to our testers in the States. Awful. I used boxes of onion skin and carbon paper. Now, in 1960, Paul was nearly 60 years old and fed up with government work. So he retired. We moved back to the States. We found this lovely house on a grand old street in Cambridge. And I said to Paul, Paul, I don't ask for much. All I want is a complete overhaul of the kitchen. I want tall counters so I don't have to stoop and walls covered with pegboard so all my pots and pans and gadgets can hang right where I can see them. We brought in my big professional oven and I finally had enough room to chop and mix and knead and whip things to my heart's content. Oh, it was such fun to be back. I could never get over the fun of shopping in those big American serve-yourself supermarkets. You, you pick out a wire pushcart, and then you just trundle about. You can pick up and examine anything you want. So lovely to choose every spear of asparagus yourself. <laughs> However, there was no time to rest. I now had about 15 pounds of galleys to proofread. That was a full-time job. I discovered to my horror that I had written things like, now add one half cup vanilla extract. <laughs> when I meant add one half teaspoon vanilla extract. Hell, a roar. As we were moving to the final deadline, Simga wrote to me about a certain cake recipe. C'est gâteau, she said. Ce n'est pas française. It cannot be in the book. Fortunately, I had kept records of all of our correspondence and discussions. I wrote her back. Simga, dearie, 
You sent me that recipe on June 3rd, 1959. We discussed all the recipes on October 9th, 1960. I wrote you to confirm the recipes on February 20th, 1961. What you see is what you sent, you discussed, and you confirmed. Ah. We had this same back and forth with at least a half a dozen recipes. Almonds, she said, in a recipe for Chew's cookies? No, no, impossible. She would slash through a recipe. It was wrong, wrong, it wasn't right, it wasn't French. <sighs> that old goat. Simka, I wrote it from your own recipe, and here it is, tous classique with almonds. Ugh. No relationship is perfect. We had our ups and our downs. Big ups and big downs. But on the whole, it was good and productive. I'm glad. We met each other. Well, finally, after seven years, the manuscript was done. So I hauled this 850-page brick to our editors at Houghton Mifflin. They took one look at it and refused. They weren't planning to publish an encyclopedia, they said. They told me, no American woman will cook like that. They want quick, easy things, things made from a mix. They had a cookbook out then by this Texas woman, Helen Corbett. I think she put marshmallows in everything. I had to go back and write to Simka. Simka, dearie. It is quite possible we have just written an unpublishable cookbook. No, no, I refuse to throw in the towel. Do not despair. We just need to do it over. <laughs> and we did. We dove in. We cut recipes. We shortened the text. And we found a new publisher, Knopf. Knopf took it on in 1961. For them, the real challenge was what to call it. The La Cuisine Française? Too foreign. Uh, French recipes for American cooks? Not snappy enough. The noble art of French cooking? Do it yourself, French cooking. How about an an incomparable book on the, the fundamental techniques and traditional dishes of French cooking adapted for use in American kitchens with American foods and American utensils by American cooks. <laughs> it took our editor, Judith Jones, the queen of putting words together like a jigsaw, to come up with mastering the art of French cooking. Because you never achieve mastery, you are always mastering an art. We've got it. No, Simca wrote from France, I do not care for that. Well, too late to change it, I said, and Knopf knows more about selling books than we do, so tant pis and too bad. <laughs> that fall, I was still unpacking boxes when one day the postman rang the bell and there it was, the book. 726 pages and heavy as a brick. Paul, Paul, it's here. This big old demon is here. I'd think this was a dream, but I can't lift my arm. It must be real. It was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. 
Now, Simca flew in to promote the book. Neither of us knew how to promote a book, but we dove in. We set up our own little book tour. One day, we took our position in a big department store. Good morning. We are starting today with a Queen of Sheba cake, or a Reine de Saba Gâteau. Now, this cake is very chocolatey with a rich, buttery taste. And we don't use whole eggs for this. We are going to separate them. Hmm? Separate them. Separated eggs. You separate the eggs! <laughs> We had to yell just to be heard. And we spent the day running around making chocolate cake and French omelets and quiches over and over. It's great fun, but it makes one feel like a hamster in a cage, running around a wheel for the amusement of others. But if it can bring some true legitimacy to real cooking after all these years of marshmallows and jello, it shall all be worth it. So there you are. This is what brought me to being on that book show and making an omelet and being invited to host my own cooking show. If we can even call it that. WGBH was absolutely bare bones. No budget to speak of. We didn't even have a set at first. We filmed at Boston Gas and Electric because they had a kitchen we could borrow. They set up two cameras in front of me and there was no editing. If anything went wrong, I just plunged ahead. When we did French onion soup, I discovered I had no sense of time, none. I just galloped through. And at the end of what was to be a 28-minute episode, there were eight minutes left. We filmed it again at great expense, and the same thing happened. So Paul stepped in. He made up these cards. We call these idiot cards. He would stand behind the cameras where I could see and hold them up. Move on, or wipe brow. We had lots of these. Slow down. When I did a potato dish, I got to the point where I had to flip the potatoes. Now, when you flip anything, you really must have the courage of your convictions. Well, that day, I didn't have the courage of my convictions. I flipped the potatoes. They sailed up, sailed down, and landed splat right on the stovetop. Just pick it up. If there's no one else in the kitchen, who is going to know? <laughs> I think people enjoyed the mistakes. Don't we all make mistakes? Cooking, a lot of it is one mistake after another, and that's how you learn. And we learned. I know today I need all the ingredients here, and then partially prepared batter here, so I can say, mix it until it looks like this. And I ended every episode the same way. I would take the finished dish over to our little dining room area, serve up a portion, and then toast. I'm Julia Child, bon appetit. Now, Here's a little secret for you. I do believe in good wine, but we had no budget. So the only wine on set was a mixture of water and gravy master. <laughs> so I always wanted to say, and now I shall enjoy a lovely glass of a state bottled grave master. <laughs> Within two years, we were on 100 PBS stations nationwide. Now, why did our show succeed when so many others didn't? 
Well, we always kept it fun. Cooking should be fun. The show was fun because I was having a good time. My producer, Ruthie Lockwood, always said, come on with a bang and don't leave with a whimper. So I would wave things around, pound dough with a rolling pin. Time Magazine said, so good is she that even men with no intention of going into a kitchen for anything more than ice cubes watch her for the sheer enjoyment of it. But I think it was more than that. Really, I was surprised at the magnitude of it. I think our timing was good. People were ready for something new. Jackie Kennedy had a French chef in the White House. But women, housewives, were always being told, do things the quick, easy way. Don't strain yourself. Something too complicated might be beyond you. But I think sometimes people want to do something special, to express themselves. There is a great satisfaction in taking on a real challenge and succeeding with it. There's nothing in cooking that's beyond the ability of someone who really wants to learn. Sometimes all you need is a good teacher. And that's what I could do. I have always thought of myself as a teacher. I can show you the best way to boil an egg, how to properly chop an onion. But perhaps I've taught everything there is. I really don't think there are many recipes in this book we haven't done. Perhaps it is time for the French chef to end. But no. No, that is not what the French chef has been about. Yes, the show has been about teaching the recipes in this book, but really, what the French chef has really been about is what French cooking is really about. It's about passion. Do you want to know the real secret of happiness in life? Hmm? It's not money. It's not fame. It's not even great achievement. The real secret of happiness in life is appetite. Hmm? Aren't I lucky to have discovered that early in life? Surround yourself with other people who love good food perfectly prepared. Don't be ashamed of your love of good food. Bring your love of good food out of the shadows and share it with people. I have always found that people are happiest when they're eating well. Now this is a lesson I think I could teach for the rest of my life. For today, however, I shall leave you all with one last wish. I wish you all a hearty appetite and that you enjoy your meals. I'm Julia Child. Bun appetit. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh, how many different characters do I do? Um, if, you, if you're not familiar with me, Leslie Goddard, so you know I'll go back to being Leslie. In fact, I should probably, if you don't mind, take off my hair. Um, so visually you will know I'm not Julia anymore. Julia Child had short, curly hair. Leslie has long hair. So visually you'll know I'm not Julia anymore. I, you know, I counted it up the other day. I have created portrayals now of 30 different women. Uh, but 
I usually only have about eight in my repertoire at any given time. So I do, um, and I've done quite a number of them here, which has um, been such a joy. I do uh, Jackie Kennedy, I do Amelia Earhart, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, I have a new portrayal of a woman who was a Pan Am stewardess. Um, I have a portrayal of a woman who was a stewardess on the Titanic. So a variety of women. Most of the women I do are 20th century American women. Not all, but mostly. Yeah. I know. And it's challenging. I mean, there's always new research coming out on every woman, you know. Keeping up with the uh, latest uh, search for Amelia Earhart is always quite a challenge. Uh, but even Julia, there was actually a new documentary that just came out two years ago called Julia. If anyone has HBO Max, it's great. And a new miniseries, which also debuted last year, also on Max, also called Julia. So go figure. Yeah. Who are, your, who are you working on for next? Who am I working on for next? I have a brand new portrayal of the fashion designer Lily Pulitzer, um, who invented those bright, bold, colored resort wear dresses. One of the most famous American fashion designers in, in American history. So she's a lot of fun. Other things, yeah. Am I a good cook? Uh, am I Leslie? Um, not really. I do cook. And uh, I have to say, part of the research for this program, I actually did do a number of Julia Child recipes because I wanted to get a sense of what made her recipes so good. And when you get into it, what, what amazed me was, first of all, I could do these recipes pretty effectively. They turned out nice. She was as concerned about technique as she was about just giving you the ingredients and the steps. So really, sometimes she'll say, hold the pan like this, you know, or, you know, you should brown it till it looks exactly like this. So her recipes are long, but partly because there's so much technique in it. So, so yeah, I was pleasantly surprised at doing that. I did grow up watching. Did anyone watch The French Chef on uh, television? I just remember it used to be on PBS on like Saturday afternoon, something like that. We always had it on. I don't think my family, we ever made anything. We just wanted to watch it because she was so much fun. <laughs> so what would Julia Child have thought about all the impersonators, especially the Saturday Night Live you know, impersonation? Uh, that's such a good question. She didn't think of herself as being particularly... Um, Amusing. She did think of herself as a ham. Uh, she actually had very, very long vocal cords and it ran in her family, which is why her voice had such a range to it. Um, however, she did see that Saturday Night Live skit. Uh, if, you, if you've never seen it, Dan Aykroyd in 1978 did this hilarious skit where Julia is preparing a chicken and cuts her finger and says, oh, I've cut the dickens out of my finger. And blood just starts spurting. And she's unfazed. You know, she just says, oh, I'm rather glad this happened. I can show you what to do if you cut yourself. And there's a tourniquet and tries all these things and none of them work and more blood and more blood is coming and more blood. Um, and it ends with her, you know, dying and saying, save the liver. Um, Julia loved it and she would act it out for people, you know, and then I die. Um, which shows you she did have a good sense of humor. First of all, you're very, very good. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Very nice of you. Thanks. And secondly, of, of the characters that you do, do you have any favorites? Do I have any favorites? You know, this is going to sound really trite. Um, it's like choosing your favorite child. You know, in a lot of ways, it takes about a year to develop a new character. So it has to be someone I'm willing to live with for a long time. So I usually choose characters I already find fascinating. So. Oftentimes, but not always, they're heroines of mine, and, and Julia Child certainly is. But they're all fun to do for different reasons. I mean, Julia Child is really fun because 
that balance between being really a ham and being a really serious, dedicated cook is kind of fascinating to, to play with. Um, but, but in different ways. I mean, Jackie Kennedy is fascinating because she was very, very private. And so figuring out a way why she would talk to people is, is as an actor, a challenge. So they all have their own, their own challenges, you know. But it's such an interesting way to do history. So uh, that itself is interesting. Yeah. So. Uh, one fun thing that I should mention, you might notice if you have really good eyesight, uh, I have the ingredients up here, but I've covered the brand names. If you watch The French Chef, and a lot of the episodes are on YouTube, she always covered up the brand names because she wanted to be completely independent. She did not want any company to profit from her using their ingredients. She could have made thousands if she had, you know, done it. And now I shall add some McCormick brand vanilla extract. Uh, she never allowed herself to do that. And, and it did give her a lot more credibility that she was independent always. Uh, so you never know what brand of butter she used, just that she used a lot of butter. Uh, let's finish up this way, the rest of the story. Julia Child was, um, was alive until, oh, alive, she, was, she died in 2004. So it's been about 20 years since she passed away. She was a few days shy of her 92nd birthday when she died. So obviously all that cream and butter did not seem to shorten her life very much. She, um, Paul preceded her in death by 10 years. He died in 1994. Uh, they sold the house in Cambridge. She was living in California towards the end of her life. But when she sold her house, the Smithsonian Institution asked if they could have her kitchen. So if you go to Washington, D.C. and go to the National Museum of American History, you can see Julia Child's kitchen. People come and leave sticks of butter there. Uh, the images on the banners here are images taken from uh, that exhibit. Um, so these are her, and here's what I love about these. Julia was a very messy cook. She would leave stuff all over. Paul was very tidy and fastidious. So he not only created these boards, but he outlined each pan. So like, this pot goes right here, Julia. Here's where it goes. So keeping her neat. It's kind of a wonderful husband-wife kind of a thing. So all right. Thank you all so much. And thanks so much for having me. Thanks. <laughs>